us pray. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and bring forth in us the fruit of good works, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Recently, my wife, Brianne, and I watched the movie The Truman Show for the first time. Who here has seen The Truman Show before? Maybe a few, just a few. That's okay. So for those of you unfamiliar with it, The Truman Show is a movie from 1998 starring Jim Carrey. Going in, I was surprised, considering it was Jim Carrey, to learn that it was really more psychological thriller than it was comedy. Now... I was also surprised at how stunningly it predicted and criticized our present day some 25 years later. Jim Carrey plays the character Truman Burbank, an insurance salesman who lives a peaceful, picture-perfect life in suburbia on Sea Haven Island. What Truman doesn't know is that for his entire life, he is the star of a show that's entirely about him. It's the biggest television show in all of human history. Truman's life is a reality TV show, a massive project led by this eccentric television director named Kristoff, who has filmed Truman since the moment of his birth until this day, some 30-something years later, totally unbeknownst to him. Now, as the viewer of the movie, you learn that everything in Truman's world is a fabrication. The island of Sea Haven and everything in it is an elaborate television set surrounded and covered by an impossibly large dome miles and miles across, which within it simulates the sky, the weather, and even day and night. All of Truman's family, his friends, everyone in the town of Sea Haven is an actor. All of it's run by the director, Kristoff. Everything in this show about Truman's life, The Truman Show, is utterly fake. And it is broadcast 24-7 across the entire world. Over a billion people tune in to watch. The turning point in the movie is when Truman begins to realize that something isn't quite right in this world around him. He has recurring memories of this woman he met in college once, whom he fell in love with. Her name was Lauren. Now, Lauren was an actor on this show who tried to tell Truman the truth about his world, that the people and everything around him were fake, that it was all a TV show. But before she could convince him, an actor portraying her father comes and drags her away. They were moving to Fiji, he said. She was written off the show, of course, for not conforming to the lie about Truman's life. After that memory, Truman, now increasingly suspicious, makes it his goal to get to Fiji, to find her so he can see her again. His mind has been changed, and his heart longs for Lauren and to know what else is out there beyond the town of Sea Haven. So he begins to catch on to the lies the people of Sea Haven are telling him, he notices that they all say the exact same things and do the exact same things each and every day. His friends and family refuse to tell him the truth about his life. They only say that which is approved by the director, only things which affirm Truman's comfortable life. The world is participating in a collective deception. Everything is fake. Whenever Truman goes against the script and refuses to conform to the world around him, the actors get angry with him. They scold him for asking questions about his life. They try to convince him that there is nothing to be desired beyond the comfy, manufactured, middle-class lifestyle, this world of Sea Haven. He's crazy to desire anything different. 
Truman also can't leave Sea Haven. Whenever he tries, there is an orchestrated operation to bring him back home. A storm, a wildfire, a traffic jam, a power plant meltdown, capture by the authorities, all of his attempts to leave are thwarted. In the latter half of the film, the Truman Show director, Kristoff, gives an interview with real world callers, viewers of this television program, about the show. One of those callers is Lauren, the woman who was previously written off, the one who wishes to see Truman freed. She accuses the director of imprisoning Truman. The director responds in a way, I think the evil one would speak of the unsaved. He says, he, Truman, could leave at any time. If his was more than just a vague ambition, if he was absolutely determined to discover the truth, there's no way we could prevent him. I think what distresses you really, caller, is that ultimately Truman prefers his cell, as you call it. Is not the course of our lives a continual choice between the determination to know the truth in Christ Jesus and our inclination to remain subject to the passions and desires of the flesh? Do not be conformed to the world, St. Paul writes, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Ultimately, Truman is determined to know the truth. He makes his escape by hiding from the cameras and sailing away off the island during the middle of the night. He survives a storm after later being spotted by the director, and he manages to crash the boat into the side of this dome, and he finds a door to the exit. But before Truman leaves, the director entreats him one final time to stay. Yes, the world is fake, he says, but it revolves around you, Truman. Truman is the star of this show. The outside world is hard. Sea Haven is safe. So why not stay? After some thoughts, Truman chooses the truth. He chooses freedom. His heart has been transformed and he desires to see the woman he loves. Truman leaves the TV set. 25 years later, our lives, I think, are more Truman Show than anything the writers of this parable could have possibly imagined back then. Between the rise of a collectivist mindset, which lashes out at any dissent from secular materialist orthodoxy, and the ubiquity of advanced technology, those who desire to walk faithfully with the Lord have likely felt much like Truman Burbank over the last several years. Pretense, comfort, and safety. These three form the pillars of modern secular life. So much of our time is spent devoted to appearance, for example, masking the truth about our age, our income, our social status, usually trying to look good in front of a camera to appease an online audience or we are the audience ourselves. Think about camera filters, for example, and all of these popular smartphone apps. Time not spent on pretense is spent seeking comfort. If not in material possessions, then by avoiding those situations and conversations where acting on the courage of our convictions, should they diverge from the values of this world, would take us far out of our comfort zone. Safety, oft conflated with comfort, is treated much the same. Should the demands of the truth call us beyond the walls of our self-constructed domes, we are urged not to take that risk, but instead to stay home with the desires of our flesh, where we also happen to be comfortable. Our obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ is lived out in the appeal of the Apostle Paul. Do not be conformed to this world, 
but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You see, faithfulness is not something which just happens to us. We must intentionally choose to live in a relationship with Jesus Christ. But how do we achieve this? How do we renew our minds? The process does not happen without first a love for God's word. Look at the words of the prophet Jeremiah today. He says, your words were found and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. Jeremiah received an inwardly digested God's words, and spoke them for the good of God's people, even though it wasn't what they wanted to hear. Of all the prophets we know, Jeremiah was the least to claim a safe, easy, and comfortable life. The weeping prophet, as we know him, preached against Israel's apostasy and warned of its destruction. And how was he repaid for his efforts? Well, with arrest, with imprisonment, and public disgrace before Babylon came in and conquered Israel and crushed Jerusalem and eventually forced Jeremiah into exile in Egypt. But Jeremiah faithfully preached the words of God anyway. A life transformed by the gospel is a life lived with integrity. That is a life that is totally devoid of pretense. Consider the words of the psalmist today. Give judgment for me, O Lord, for I have lived with integrity. I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. Terrifying prayer, is it not? How many of us honestly want to ask God that question? Give judgment for me, Lord. Test me and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. I know it gives me pause. Most days, there's a lot of junk in there to examine. I don't want to open that back up. The irony, of course, is that God already knows our baggage, doesn't he? But are we willing to let go of that baggage in confession? Are we willing to no longer conform ourselves to how the secular culture says we should look, think, and act, freeing ourselves to love the house in which the Lord dwells and the place where his glory abides. Our gospel passage offers us one more example in Matthew chapter 16. Verse 21 marks a transition from Jesus' earlier Galilean ministry to now looking ahead to his passion in Jerusalem. He's looking ahead, and as Jesus explains his impending suffering and death to the apostles, who but Peter is there to speak his mind, to say the thing that everyone else there is afraid to say, just as we've seen him do in the last several gospel readings. Peter, having a traditional Jewish understanding of the Messiah, did not get what Jesus was saying about going to suffer and die. The Messiah is supposed to be victorious, He's not supposed to suffer. Peter, in his typical boldness, takes matters one step further as he tries to rebuke Jesus. And a disciple correcting his master, let alone rebuking him, would have been totally unheard of. Peter was totally out of bounds here. Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Perhaps Jesus didn't know what the Messiah was supposed to do. Perhaps Jesus doesn't have it all under control. Let me offer him some advice. Sure, as if we don't try and correct Jesus the exact same way from time to time. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter's refusal to accept Jesus' suffering and death is taken as a satanic attempt to divert Jesus from his ultimate mission. No doubt, Jesus immediately recalled 
his own encounter with Satan when he was tempted in the desert at the start of his ministry, hence the emphatic response to Peter's rebuke. What's remarkable is that this passage I found is the mirror image of the previous passage from Matthew 16, which we received last week. Not long before this, Peter had just confessed Jesus as the Messiah there in Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus named him the rock on which he would build his church. And now Peter does a complete 180, get behind me, Satan. What happened? What's going on here? Remember that previously upon hearing Peter's confession, Jesus told him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. When Peter earlier responded in faith, he spoke in accordance with what God the Father had revealed. Now, when Peter tries to rebuke Jesus, he is thinking and speaking in conformity with what the Jewish authorities assumed about the Messiah, that he would achieve worldly victory and not the truth which Jesus himself had revealed, that he must suffer and die. Peter was thinking and speaking from conformity with the world and not conformity with God. Jesus continues by telling the disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Here, Jesus lays out the condition for true discipleship, readiness to follow him to the point of giving up one's own life. This requires self-denial. Here in the text, meaning to disown oneself. To truly be a disciple of Jesus, we must disown ourselves as the center of our own existence because Jesus is the true center. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You can't follow Jesus if you are the center of your own universe. There's no room for him if the world revolves around you. But the wisdom of the world won't tell you that. In the end, Truman denied himself the chance to live out his days in a world built to revolve around him so that he could live in true freedom and seek a relationship with the one whom he loved. We must make a similar choice every day, brothers and sisters, to ignore the world telling us that we ourselves matter above all else and instead decide to step through that door to pick up our cross and to follow Jesus only if our hearts are transformed. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.